Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Contract Revolution. This is Benji and Igor at the studio. This week, we are excited to have none other than Brian Scudamore on the show, the founder and CEO of the world's largest junk removal company, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Now, Brian's fascinating story on the creation of Got Junk has been covered hundreds of times on the internet, from him on Ellen to Guy Raz's How I Built This. So we're not going to cover all that specific stuff again. Over the next hour with Brian, we're going to dive into the dynamics of the all-important relationship of a visionary founder and the key executor of a strategy within a business or often called the integrator. Brian is a really interesting guy in the world of home services. He brings an incredible strength to the table and has a huge amount of vision for what could be, but he's also very clear on what his strengths are not. Accounting, project management, holding accountability, details, delegation, a whole slew of other stuff too. To compensate for the things he doesn't love and is not great at, he's developed an uncanny ability to surround himself with those who are and learn how to position everyone in his organization in their true power zones. I've known Brian for quite a number of years now, and something that I've noticed is that he almost always has this uniquely positive and calm energy about him. And I really think it's rooted in the fact that he simply chooses to enjoy and to embrace the entrepreneurial and business journey. And I suspect that a big part of this is related to how much he plays to his strengths and realizes that it's not always worth it to fight uphill. Brian's message is an important one. If you were just average and sort of well-rounded, well-balanced, you'd probably be working at a bank right now, but you're not. You're an entrepreneur, meaning you're loaded with vision and passion for what you do, but could add a whole bunch of horsepower by complementing your natural skill sets with a strong counterpart. And it's the understanding of this exact concept that turbocharged Brian's company from a small junk hauling operation in Vancouver to a half a billion dollar a year empire. So let's get into real world dynamics of visionaries and integrators with Brian Scudamore. You're watching Contractor Evolution where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Brian, welcome to the show. It's awesome to see you. It's awesome to see you. I love being here with you guys. Yeah, thanks for doing this. I want to start with... Uh, I want to start with one of my favorite quotes. I think you know it too. It's by Thomas Edison. It's vision without execution is hallucination. And that's always really clicked for me. In the context of this conversation we're going to have today about visionary thinking, finding your integrator, building a great COO, and, and having those, those two talents, those two superpowers lead uh, a business to what it's meant to become. What does that line, vision without execution is hallucination, what does it mean to you? I've always said in our businesses that we are building something much bigger and better together than we could ever build alone. Now, I said that we could ever build alone. I couldn't, with just my vision, build 1-800-GOT-JUNK or O2E Brands. I need some help. I'm the idea guy in a lot of the sense, but I need somebody in a team of people that can take the vision and turn it into execution. I know we're going to talk about Eric Church, our incredible implementer. But it's really one of those things where if you have a vision and you don't have some steps to get there, it just stays a big idea. How do you personally uh, think about this idea of the two-piece puzzle? You know, like, like uh, you know, ideas person, visionary person versus integrator. Some people might use the terminology CEO, COO. I'm sure a whole bunch of, oh, there's all kinds of terminology around how you might call this relationship. But how do you personally just think about this? I think when I look at my own, if I reflect on my own journey, the first 10 years of getting 1-800-GOT-JUNK to a million in revenue, I was a visionary and an implementer. I, I had to be. I couldn't afford a hired hand. I started to realize that my gift is big ideas, big possibilities. I didn't know how to translate something into a scalable model. I was good at systems. I was good at finding, building a great culture and having fun with people. But beyond a million, beyond two million, I couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really that two in the box. You've got a visionary, an implementer or an integrator. How do those two people work together 
to build something special. I, I can't do it alone. I wouldn't choose to do it alone. And I know you're going to get into my weaknesses probably at some point. My, I know we've only got an hour, <laughs> but lots and lots of weaknesses. And I think an entrepreneur's primary role is to recognize where their gifts are and get the heck out of their way, their own way, with things that they don't do well. Brian, can you tell us a bit about like that feeling of stuckness that you kind of alluded to, whether, and, and the revenue mark isn't really what I'm specifically asking for, whether it was a million or two million, but what are some of the things that were going on in the business, were going on for you kind of internally that you were feeling? Um, tell us a bit about that point of stuckness and what that looked like when you realized that it's, you know, that your personality style, your operating and leadership style wasn't going to necessarily be able to take it to the next level. What, what, what did you feel at that point as you were starting to hit mud? Yeah. So we've got our top franchise owner, the biggest one in revenue and a close friend to saw him yesterday is Paul Guy in Toronto. Paul came from College Pro and he understood coaching. He understood how to develop people. I didn't know how to do that. I'd never been in a company or a role where I learned that skill. So where I easily got stuck hard in the beginning was how do I, we did a student model of franchising with the Rubbish Boys, my right. first name of the business. And we had 15 trucks across British Columbia, these student franchises. These people were awesome. Culturally, I helped to find the right people and treat them right. I didn't know how to develop them. And so Paul Guy was brought on and he got me completely unstuck. Hmm. He said, here's everything I learned at College Pro. Interesting. Here's how we do GSNRs, goal setting and review. We're going to make these people better. And he did. And that set the platform, not just for him to become the first franchise partner after he worked with us corporately, but it gave us a platform of how do we find the right people in the field that can coach and develop franchise partners to really build an amazing partnership mm -hmm. on their end. And how did you come to the realization yourself to to go to somebody like this, which at that time must have been kind of still relatively in your relationship and relinquish that, that much control and say like, hey, Paula, can you take some of this? Someone who didn't finish school, right? I went to 14 schools from kindergarten through till college, never graduated from anything except kindergarten. And I realized that my way of learning, I'm an ADD entrepreneur, can't sit in school. My way of learning is from others, from asking questions. You and I have had lunch and we yeah. learn from each other and it's always fun. My way of learning was from EO, the entrepreneur organization. And Cameron Harold, who was in my forum group at the time, he ended up becoming our COO, our first COO. He was the one that when I shared with him, I'm having this problem. I don't know how to make our people better. I don't know if we've got the right people. I don't know how to develop them to the next level. And he said, you know who you should bring on board is Paul Guy. Hmm. He gave me the formula. I asked for help and he said, Paul Guy is one of the most amazing coaches I've ever met. You should see what he's doing and see if we can get him in. And we did. Fascinating. Sometimes that path isn't as treacherous and difficult as you might think. This, this actually brings me back to, I remember a very distinct phone call between you and I when I was kind of like, you know, I, I'm realizing the importance and power of a really good brand. And I, and, and I was like, Hey, who, who does this? Well, I was like, right, Brian. And I called you and I was like, you know, what would be like, do you have any recommendations? And you're like, hundred percent call Noel Fox. Here's his cell phone number. And I was like, and then, and now we've been working with Noel Park for seven years now. And, but it was that easy. It was like, try this path here. Here's someone who really knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, it, mm -hmm. It's, it's maybe not as complex and difficult as one might think. Well, you, you've got me on to one of the biggest ideas I've ever been taught and has been invaluable to me. You never know what you'll get unless you ask. Ask for help. Entrepreneurs often think they've got to have this big ego and I'm smart enough. I don't need anyone to help me. Go ask for help. Yeah. In the same way I recommended Noel Fox to you, Chip Wilson, Lululemon recommended Noel to me. He goes, oh my gosh, Brian, what you're looking to do, the best on the planet is Noel Fox. Call him. Hmm. Easy. When we ask for help and we reach out to our networks and say, here's our problem, who has a solution? Yeah. Someone always does. Why make it any harder than that? Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. There's a very, very powerful concept. Um, t tell me this. I want to talk about like very specific like strengths and weaknesses in one's own personality. At what point in your career did you start to quite consciously think about this to take like a skills inventory and be able to, and I don't know if it's that literal, but like take a page and, you know, strengths on one side, weaknesses on the other, and, and to really think through that, like where, what am I and what am I not? When, when did that kind of come about for you? 
I'm not a big reader. Um, my wife is a voracious reader. I'm a voracious book buyer. So I buy these books. <laughs> they sit on the shelf. True, true story. One book that is on my shelf somewhere is Marcus Buckingham, First Play to Your Strengths. Okay. So I know the title. I've got value. Play to your strengths because if we spend all this time trying to approve our weaknesses, it's too hard. Yeah. If you're not a great skier and you're not incredibly passionate about being a great skier, go find something else you're good at. Yeah. It could be chess. It could be another physical sport. It doesn't it's, it's matter. It's okay. You really it, believe that, hey? Like tri I, triple down on your strengths and kind of to hell with your weaknesses? To hell with your weaknesses. I'm, I'm going to keep that. I'm going to use that. Thanks, Benji. Um, here's the thing. I feel one of my gifts, did I inherit it? Did I come across it naturally? Is it something I've, I've just got a passion for? Is, is vision, belief in big possibility. Simon Sinek, I think we know Simon. Simon spent some nights on my couch in the early days as he was developing his concept of why. He tested me and said, let me help you uncover your why. And my why is, if you imagine big things, you never know they might happen. How can I inspire others to imagine big possibilities for themselves? I'm good at vision. I freaking love visioning big ideas. I love when people tell me, no, Brian, that's not a good idea. Don't do it. And I go, you watch. We're going to figure it out and make it a good idea. If I focused on my weaknesses, how to be better in school, how to get through it, how to get a degree, too much time, too hard, it's too much friction. And what's the and, and, and like what's the upside? You you get um, you get marginally better at things that you're terrible at. So you go from a one out of ten to a three out of ten after tons of work and discipline and exhaustion. It's like where where's the I guess what I'm hearing from you is where's the benefit? What do I truly stand to gain by hating skiing and then becoming able to do a green run barely? Mm -hmm. Right. Like it's just uh, it's an interesting philosophy towards it. You hear Gary Vee talks about this all the time. It's like triple down in your strengths and just forget about the yeah. rest of it and surround yourself with people that have those. I'm curious, like while we're here, can we go through the quick laundry list of what are those like, you know, you said, hey, like you literally have a piece of paper and strengths on one side. Mm -hmm. What's on that we, right side? What's on that right side? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good thought exercise here. Yeah. And when we t when in the frame of finding an implementer, one of the things that I did, the very first thing I did was I took a sheet of paper, drew a line down the middle, and I said, on one side, what, do I, what am I good at? What do I love to do? On the other side, what am I bad at and don't like to do? I was asking that figuratively. I didn't realize you literally no, did No, I, I literally did it. It took me 10 minutes off the top of my head, write these things down. And in finding the right COO, the in implementer, I said, I've got to find somebody who's hate to do bad ats complement and are almost flipped with my stuff. So what I ended up doing is I created that list on the hate to do bad ats, staying focused on one task or one level of a project over and over and over. I, I get bored. I can't stick with it. I lose interest. But you can't execute with excellence without having someone that wants to see it through to the finish line. I'm very quick start. Love ideas, love opportunities. I want to give it to someone else. I'm bad at delegating. I'm great at abdicating. Hey, here you go, Benji. <laughs> Take it. Right. But if I don't follow up and check in and have the processes and rigor to do so, to make sure you're on track, if you need some help and support, I'm not great at hiring. I know how to read people very quickly and whether or not I like people. I like you. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I go in an interview when I am sitting there for an hour going through questions. I'm like, ah, oh, I already know this person isn't the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have the patience mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. So there's a lot I don't like to do. Uh, there's a lot I'm just not good at. But that's where you find people that are great at it. Now, you know, some of your viewers, listeners might say, but you got to be well-rounded. Like you can't just ignore everything that you're not good at that you don't like to do. When you're starting a business, you have to understand the financials. If you don't, you know, you're, you're screwed. Your company could risk falling apart. You can't afford people in the early days to come on in the door and help you out. So I had to do the accounting. I had to do the payroll, but I had to quickly get myself out of that role and find someone else to wear that hat so that things could scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Brian, this path 
which is kind of the opposite path of working on your weaknesses, becoming exceptionally well-rounded. Do you feel that it is a riskier path because you are relatively quickly now delegating, oh, you're a great financial controller, you have a CPA, boom, come on in, take it, right? You're really great at operating people and hiring, okay, head head of people operations, boom, in go. That inherently opens some risk because you then obviously command less authority and control over what's going on. How do you weigh that, like, I can progress faster, I will enjoy this more, we have more potential upside, but we also take on more risk because I'm giving up a lot more oversight and control. How do you weigh those two factors and and what has been your conclusion on that? Yeah, so I said I'm good at systems. I still have systems for myself that work. So when I delegate now, to someone to say, hey, you're in charge of the financials. I inspect what I expect. I'm not in their role and in their world, but I'm still diving in once in a while to have a meeting to say, so what does this mean? Tell me about this. I ask lots of questions and listen, and I inspect what I expect. If my expectation is A, let me sit down and go in and go, hey, is that actually happening? Does it fit my vision? Does it fit what they expected. So inspect what you expect, ask questions and listen. You can't just turn something over to someone and never ever check in. And I don't mean micromanage, I'm not a micromanager, but I wanna sit down and go, hey, Igor, how's it going? Tell me about it. Are we winning here? Why or why not? I love solving problems. I love giving ideas, but I don't wanna be managing in a micro way day to day. Mm -hmm. You can't just let it go, that's abdicating. And that's where when I say, one of my weaknesses was abdicating. I'm not good at delegating. I have learned, mm-hmm. but we also have now people in the company that help manage that delegation, which yeah. makes it easier. I think that one of the really most critical self-discovery journeys for entrepreneurs is to figure out where they fit on that spectrum. And I'll just make an extreme example. On one end, it's breathing down your deck, your neck, micromanager everything needs to be inspected as soon as it happens. And then on the other end is just kind of like loosey goosey. I would call them ideas guys, right? Where it's like, here's something, here's something, whiteboard session, we're going to get all inspired, but then there's just bump zero it over to them, fo- never zero come back. follow yeah. through yeah. or follow up or anything. And I think for every entrepreneur, they're naturally going to sit, they might want to grip things a little tighter. They might want to grip things a little looser, but you do need to kind of find where you sit on that spectrum and start to build that muscle. And I love the line, inspect what you expect. If you're working with competent people, it doesn't take much. It's a, it's a follow-up 10 days later where it's like, hey, remember we spoke about this thing? Can you just show me where you're at on that right this yeah. second? It's, it's not this... Uh, white knuckle approach where you're gripping it super tightly. Um, but you really need to watch the tendency to just, you know, and I'm sure you've had to learn this where it's, it would be easy and fun to just be the ideas guy Start forever. stuff, you let ha- it go and be gone. You yeah, have totally. to have a little bit of that, that follow-up muscle. What can you say about, um, what can you say? I think that entrepreneurs have to have a healthy amount of ego. And the key word there is healthy. I don't think ego is necessarily bad. I think in extreme quantities it can be, but it is what gets you out of bed in the morning. It is what gives you that swagger that you need to take big shots. Look at sports, it's the same way. You look at entertainment, it's the same way. So I'm a fan of ego when uh, bridled a little bit. But one of the things that struck me when you talk about my list of bad ats, my list of bad ats, there's some reflection required there to really look at yourself and go, I'm actually not like, wow, I'm actually not (laughs) that good at that many things. I'm really good at a few of them, but there's this laundry list of stuff that I'm like pretty weak at. What can you say about keeping your swag or keeping your ego in a healthy place, keeping your self-belief while also admitting to yourself, hey, I'm getting humbled a bit because I've I've clearly got some downside also. I think it's looking at the extremes of yourself and saying, what am I really, really good at? What am I the best on the planet at? Put it put it in those extremes. What am I really bad at? Okay, there's a lot of bad ats, but look at this gift I've got. Mm. If I personally, which I feel I'm awesome at visioning and dreaming up possibilities and getting people excited, put everything into that. But find people to surround me that can do the bad ats, can hold me accountable to being the visionary, but in a balanced approach. Mm -hmm. You know, Eric Church, our president will say, 
okay, Brian, great idea. We're going to write that one down. We're going to talk about it in three months, maybe six months, or maybe it's a bad idea. And let's just shelve it. We don't even have space for that idea right now. Mm -hmm. So there's some partnership there of great visionary. Thank you, Brian. Good ideas, but maybe not right now. Yeah. So it's all it's all in balance, but you need the self-reflection. And I the quote that I always hold dear and near to my heart is that don't be the smartest person in the room. And I it's easy for me because I know I've got a gift or a couple of gifts and I'm bad at a lot of stuff. Most rooms I'm in, I am not the smartest person in the room. Did and you ever have to did you ever have a moment where you're like, "Oh man, I suck" and you had to pick yourself up off the floor? Or, or wait, did did you was there some self-acceptance that just came easy to you when you made this list of bad ads? Yeah, so here's a quick story. Cameron Harold was with us from 2 million to 106 million in revenue. It was time for us to part ways. We're still great friends. We talked the other day, but Cameron and I were two fire ready aim guys at the helm. It didn't work to have both of us be a little too ADD and scattered at times. So I went out and I looked for another leader and it was an ex Starbucks president, thought I'd hit the jackpot, brought this person in to run my hundred million ish dollar business. And in 14 months, we almost bankrupted the business. Smart person, talented person, but the wrong person for me. This wasn't a two in the box. They didn't see my vision and want to be a part of it. They had a bit of their own vision and execution, and that didn't work. So you went too far the other way. Maybe. Too far the other way. I went for the pedigree yeah. of ex-Starbucks president. I mean, this is amazing. This person wanted to move back to Canada. Wow, perfect timing. I got the wrong person for me. Our franchise partners didn't understand when I ended that relationship, and they said, hey, listen, you have a really smart person here. What are you doing not doing this? And they reiterated to me, they said, Brian, like, fine that you've gotten this person out of the business, but let's be 100% clear, you are not that person. Right. Mm -hmm. You are not the person to build and scale this business to the next level. Yeah. You do not have what it takes. So hearing that humbled me, hearing that from so many franchise owners that I wasn't the guy, part of me went, well, uh, how can you say I'm not the guy? I started this thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not good enough. I had to reflect and it was a dark period, but I realized you're right. I'm not good enough. Yeah. This is not my job. If this company is to scale, I need an executor and I need the right person who believes in me. That's where I did that list, the good ats, the bad ats, separated it and went and searched to find the perfect COO yeah. or president yeah. for me. Yeah, very interesting. And I think coming back to, to Benji's original question on this, it's it's a really important bit. Like you it you are really comfortable and happy with who you are and where you're at yeah. sitting on that left side of the page and your strengths. Mm -hmm. Right. And and mm -hmm. I, I feel that from you every, every time we hang out, like there's a, there's a calm, humble nature that's confident quietly. And just like, you know who you are Yeah, and that's pretty sophisticated. Yeah. yeah know who is. you are and, and be okay with it. Right. Yeah. Recognize I have not met a person in this world that does not have a gift if you really dive in and try and find it. Yeah. Find something to feel good about and be confident about yeah. in whatever Amazing. role you're in. So I want to I wanna click in here on the search and how you found this person and, and the journey along the way. Um, when you became, a, it became abundantly clear to you that there was a, you know, another piece to the puzzle. How did you first begin to develop selection criteria or start to define the role for who you were looking for? So when we fail and we make a mistake and we reflect, that allows us to continue to grow and get better the next time around. So Cameron Harold, great relationship, great growth. The ex Starbucks person, I failed the company. I failed myself. But I understood in reflecting why didn't it work and what would I do differently? I needed to find someone that believed in the entrepreneur, believed in me while being able to execute together in partnership. Mm -hmm. So when I made that list, that was the most impactful thing I ever did to find in finding Eric. What am I good at and love to do? What am I bad at and hate to do? Now go search for someone that has those other things that would complement me. When I got out and started looking, I created a mini painted picture that described the person I was looking for. Their winning attitude, their desire to build a brand with an entrepreneur, their ability to love people, help grow people and develop them. They loved numbers and measuring the winning and the goals and celebration. And I, I painted this short little picture of exactly who I was looking for. I got so specific to say, 
they have to want to call Canada home. Interesting. Because in my recruiting journeys early on, I found someone in Boston who realized in the end he, he would have been a great fit. He couldn't relocate to Vancouver because trading a 5,000 square foot home for a little studio apartment doesn't Wasn't quite work. work. So I got so specific. I put it out to the universe, so to speak, my LinkedIn network, my world, and said, hey, I'm looking for a partnership here, someone to help me build something bigger and better together. Here is who I'm looking for. Now, here's the magic and how it worked. When I sent it out, I got all sorts of suggestions and resumes, but I had three different people, different networks in different parts of the world that said, you describe Eric Church. You need to call Eric Church. I was, I'm getting chills. I was so clear on what I was looking for that those three people, they did not say to me, here's five people I can think of. They're like this guy. They said, you need to call Eric Church. Now, Eric was gainfully employed, was president of a large company, but he was my guy. I had to go search and I interviewed 75 COOs flying all over the country, testing, do I have the right fit? But Eric being one of them, I kept coming back to Eric. And this courtship of I'd go to Toronto, meet with him, he'd come to Vancouver, hang out. We took it slow to understand, is this really for us? And, uh, and it was. And so these people were right because I was clear what I was looking for for me. Yeah. So again, people always ask me, where did Eric come from? What was his background, this and that? It doesn't matter. It's that I knew what I was looking for and he was the right guy, so to speak, for me. Could he build another brand? Absolutely, but he wanted a partnership with an entrepreneur where they could build this something special together. So it was finding the, almost like a marriage, finding the right fit for yeah. us. So it's amazing when you have a very, very clear, clear and, and detailed ask of the universe. It usually serves it up on a, on a silver platter. That's been my experience for sure. Let me ask you about a, a really core piece that I think is so important to a lot of entrepreneurs that, that start something when it's your baby, and that is like the heart of the organization, like the values, those deeper kind of like ways of operating the way that we are inside of our company. How did you figure that out with, and it, it could be Eric, but we could use others as I mean, you've, you've hired hundreds, you know, there's been thousands of people in the organization, but, but especially, especially when we're talking about key people, could have been Cameron Harold, could have been the ex Starbucks executive, uh, could be Eric. How do you figure out whether there's truly a values fit and where they will carry those values through to the organization when mm -hmm. realistically, like you haven't worked with this person before the Starbucks person, Eric, so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, years ago, I had my first leadership team. There must have been six of us. We did a little retreat to Bowen Island an hour from here. My parents had a little shack on the water. And I remember I'd read Good to Great. I think it's right behind us here. I read Good to Great and Jim Collins says, it's your values that will really help shape your, your future. Everyone has values. Even if you don't know what they are and haven't spelled them out, you've got to do so. I sat down and I said, okay, I've just read this book, Good to Great, or listened to it on CD. What are the things that we are already, that already describe who we are? What are the words? We took out post-it notes. I had these six people all write out the words. We put them up on these windows of this waterside cabin. And then we organized these 400 post-it notes. It ended up being four similar categories and just about every post-it note fit into four categories that we went, oh, that clearly talks about passion, integrity, professionalism, and empathy. Those are our values. Because I said to everybody, Jim says, describe who you already are, not who you want to be. Mm. So what we valued was pipe, passion, integrity, professionalism, and empathy. In every meeting, in every interview, that's what we hold near and dear. Does this person have passion? Did Cameron Harold have passion? Hell yeah. I mean, passion's his middle name. We would go through people and just make sure they had that, all four, and we hire and fire on values. If someone doesn't demonstrate the values and you can't develop them through values, of course, if it's a wrong values fit and a misalignment, you get them out. Yeah. But when it's right and you've got a whole organization filled with people aligned by values, and let's face it, diversity of opinions, of values, of culture, of everything in our organization is strong, but people are aligned and brought together by a common value set of why we're here right. building these great brands. I've always wondered, like, is, there, is how do you, on a, on a, 
on a technical level, like people always say this, we, we hire on values, we fire on values. How do you interview for that? Are you asking Eric, hey, are you passionate? And he goes, you bet I am. Like, I don't think so, right? Like, like so how, do you bring up a conversation around these words or these themes? Do you not bring up a conversation? You just you just know what they are and you sit back and observe and try to see if they're there. Like what's for, – for a, for a more junior entrepreneur who – obviously believes in this philosophy when it comes to personnel. Is there any advice you'd give them on making those those selections and, and how to do that in these you know, those early conversations, whether it be by phone or in person or over Zoom, when they're getting close to making a decision on someone, how do you quantify that we're values aligned? So we have something we call the beer and barbecue test. Would I, when I'm interviewing someone, sit down and have a beer with someone? Do I find them interesting and interested? Do we have a shared common passion? And do our values fit? The barbecue test is when there's a group of people in the comp when there's someone interviewing uh, at a different a different person in the business. We look at how would they fit into a group of our company. How would they be at a company picnic, barbecue party? Do they fit in? We're not looking for all extroverts. We've got plenty of introverts, and there's good balance. But do they just fit? Is it a good house party, so to speak? So it's being very careful. But you know, I would say, hey Benji, how do you find new friends? You probably don't have a list. You probably don't interview people. But when you're sitting down having a beer or doing what you're doing, you can just tell because what you're subconsciously doing is going, does that person fit my values? Totally. Do they like and love the things I do? Is there a commonality? So it's really easy. So was I interviewing Eric on passion? Yeah, I was. What do you do for fun? He'd tell me about his duck hunting and he'd tell me about his outdoor exhibitions and his travel around the world and 108 countries and like the it's way he talks. off of them. You can yeah. just see it. Right? So all those things you can look at and yeah. it's hard to interview in one interview and get to know someone in that way. So the more senior per person you've got coming into the company, the more time you have to spend having dinner together, going for a walk together, going to meet their wife, their spouse. Like these are important things in helping to test your is this person a perfect beer and barbecue fit? How important is industry experience? Because we, a lot of people, you know, our listeners would be entrepreneurs uh, in a whole host of industries, uh, generally between one and $10 million a year. At that midway point, as they're kind of growing, I think a lot of them are, are looking for a COO, an integrator, a right-hand man or woman. And a lot of, I think something that a lot of people struggle conceptualizing is, is how, how could I have someone at this level of leadership be successful if they don't know the absolute ins and outs, every single detail of construction or, or landscaping or, or roofing or whatever. In your experience, is, is industry, Matt, is industry experience a deal breaker? Uh, is it not? I will, I make some comments about that. I would go so far, and, and this is my opinion, I would go so far in my experience in O2E to say industry experience probably has zero value. Almost a complete zero. So Shack Shine, we do windows, gutters, power washing, Christmas lights. Anyone we brought into our business that came from window cleaning, it hasn't worked. They already have a predetermined way that they're doing things. We want people to go, hey, we are revolutionizing an industry. House detailing industry is getting done in a different way. Or the painting industry, where we go with wow and day painting and paint people's homes in a day. The people that are most skeptical are the painters. They go, you can't paint a home in a day. We don't want people that don't believe. We want believers to come in. And even if they're a little naive in the beginning and go, this say, is a big idea. Yeah, There's some magic there, right? It's um, so you're you're actually taking it a step further. You're almost saying the industry experience is a bad thing when you have a bit when you have a super big vision. Like it's it it can, uh, it can get in the way because there's preconceived notions about how things ought to be inside this type of business versus that type of business. Um, how much franchise experience do you think Eric Church had? I don't know zero zero. Yeah, that's really fascinating. But he learns so quickly. He's passionate. He's smart. He asks the right questions. Yeah. He got on the road and met franchise partners like there was no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he understood franchising very quickly, understood our way of franchising, but brought his real world experience to the table versus industry experience. Yeah. So I want to bring up a really overarching theme here just from this conversation and, and knowing Brian for, for many years now, which is like there is a general view, like a, a real optimism and excitement about life and business. And a part of that is 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 this notion that life is not that 
difficult. Business is not that difficult. If you're smart, you're passionate, you can figure it out. If you've got certain gifts, you should use those gifts. And I think that is kind of a theme that, that's been interwoven in, the, in this conversation of like, you can go do amazing things. You can go figure things out. You can learn. You can you can develop, and and that that is a very I that is an energy. I think like I feel that energy from you, um, and it's a perspective. So okay, I want to dive into. Uh, I want to hone in on a very specific topic, a topic that I think a lot of business owners find quite daunting, which is when you're bringing in a high level leader into your business. That onboarding development training period, whatever you want to call it, could be really, really challenging and quite risky because you are inherently about to give up a ton of control. And you also, being a founder, kind of want it done in some semblance of a certain way, at least around some of the core fundamentals, values, all this kind of stuff. Um, when you brought, when Eric came into the business, um, and you can think of other leaders, it doesn't have to be, you have amazing managing directors, like we've had James Alish on the show, and it, it, it's, it, you know, a plethora of amazing people. When they're coming into the organization for the first time, um, how do you go about doing that? And I'll ask you some some specific questions, like how do you actually figure out what the structure is of the working dynamic in their role? Like we talked about, you know, this, this piece of paper with the left and the right. Is it as simple as you take the stuff on the right and now it's your job? Or is there a lot more to it than that? Like how do you dial in their role? How do you create an onboarding period where someone who is so smart, so passionate, so driven and for coming from another world can get to know 1-800-GOT-JUNK or O2E? Can you give us some comments on what that onboarding and training time looks like? So two things. How did we separate responsibilities and roles? We took the love and hate list and we said, okay, who should be doing what? You got to have someone overseeing hiring and building teams and development and financial oversight and vision and strategy and marketing and branding. So we divided it all into a spreadsheet and then we put names beside it. Hmm. And then we said, so who's the ultimate decision maker? One person, SPA, single point accountability. If we disagreed, then what were we going to do? How would we talk about it? Mm. How would we work through these things? And we were up front in our expectations. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't let go of the reins right away. It took me probably a good year with Eric. And he knew this. I felt I had burned myself with the ex-Starbucks situation. I failed. I abdicated. Not good at it. This time I learned. I brought it closer. And I said, how do we, Eric, you and I spend so much time together that we're almost sick of each other, but that we're so joined at the hip and aligned that we know how to make decisions together even when we're not in the same room. And so hmm. whenever we went to meetings and we traveled out of town, we sat side by side in economy together and we talked. Whenever we had meals, lunch, breakfast, you name it, we sat together and we talked. Wow. When we had time to just walk and get some fresh air in between some meetings, we'd often, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? We spent hours and hours and hours invested in each other, getting to know each other, getting to know what made us both tick, getting to know how we make decisions. And it was that year of really letting go of things bit by bit by bit that led to our success. It's been 12, I guess, 13 years uh, coming up this month. Yeah. And it's unbelievable. I mean, I don't even think Eric, and, well, I know Eric and I have never had a fight. We've disagreed on things, but we know how to work through it. And there's a magic in our relationship because of how we set it up together. Yeah, that that's so interesting. Thanks for painting the picture that that, that clearly. Because I was literally going to ask that question. I was going to ask you, like, what is like the single most important thing that you did over the course of that first year to set it on the right track? And that's a big one. So you're saying you you intentionally set it up that that you have a huge amount of interaction over that the course of that year with the goal of by the end of this, we want to be able to make as many decisions when we're apart the way that we would when we're together. Bingo. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. Um, when, and inevitably it does, certain, not con it could be conflict, but it could be differing viewpoints come up. Can you give us some very practical guideline on like how you guys actually approach that when, you know, there's a decision point and Eric's like, I think we should go left and you're like, I, th I think we should go right. How do you flush through that? Yeah, I've got a great story. So O2E has three brands. There was a day you remember we had four. We had a moving company. 
moving is not our space. It's not a happy business. It was. It didn't fit our. When someone haul you haul away junk, a customer goes, "Wow, this is amazing. It's gone. Relief." Right. Or you paint someone's home, they go, "Oh, transformation." Shack shine. You do windows. Wow, I can see through my windows again. When you move, I'm stressed. Stuff's broken. It's lost. Moving stressful. So we got out of that business. It was eight years of trying to build that brand, and we came to a point an inflection point, and it was stressful, not in our relationship, Eric and I, but stressful in the standpoint that like this business isn't working like we thought it would. So Eric wanted out. I wanted to keep going. I still believed in possibility. He didn't, and he had some clear reasons why in his mind. So I presented to my EO forum, a bunch of smart people, and said, here's what's going on, and this is like a conflict. we got to figure out how to get through because we disagree not fighting, not publicly disagreeing. No one would know. And, but it was just, I could tell we were from different places. So someone in my forum group said, I know you always talk about two in the box, visionary and implementer. You subscribe to that model mm. of rocket fuel, even though I haven't read the book. Eric has, right? The executor <laughs> read the reads title. it. Exactly. I'm the That's visionary. <laughs> yeah. But it meant something to me. Visionary and implementer. In that book, it talks about tie goes to the implementer. Correct. Someone told me this in my forum and I went, Wow. So I went and met with Eric and I go, listen, you don't like this moving business? Ty goes to the implementer. This is all yours. And I mean that. You make the decision. I will support you no matter what, because you're the one that has to execute on the unwinding the company or selling it or whatever we're going to do. That did probably wonders for both of us in terms of clarity of relationship going through a conflict. We made the decision. I bought in and then ended up getting very much on board with He's really making the right decision. Thank goodness he was pushing me and we made it happen and no regrets. I've thought a lot about that whole, and that, that is one of the best, best rules in the book. There's a number of them, but that was one, one that really clicked. And I've thought a lot about it. I think they talk about it in the book too, but the reason that is, is the, the integrator is the one who's more tied to reality by nature of the role. They're the one who has to actually do it. And they deal with the consequences. And they deal with the, con it's not that the visionary doesn't, also, but they're they're sort of separated by a layer a little bit. They get to play in a more creative, future oriented space. The COO, the integrator, has to deal with the screw up of this decision right now and for the next six months or the next year, whatever. And so there, it's sort of uh, you're, you're honoring the fact that they're going to have to clean up the mess inevitably by giving them those tie breaks. And I just think that's a really intuitive rule when you really think about it. Yeah, yeah it really is. And Brian, let me ask you this. Uh, you and I are very different, like very, very different. I am a full on integrator type. Um, from my perspective, and maybe it's biased, but there is sometimes a feeling that it is a bit of a thankless job. Like it's it's always Igor that has to come in, or it could be Eric, or you know, wh wh whoever has to come in. Actually, James Alish is, is another one example that comes, and it's always big bad James, big bad Igor that has to come in and force, hold the line, hold the structure, enforce. Um, it feels like a bit of a thankless job sometimes. Like, and, and, and how do you guys balance that? Like it, 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 is that even your, is, is that the case from, um, from your experience and, and, and why is that? And, and how do you support that as someone that is often maybe a bit more voice of the culture and the fun and the heartbeat of, of the organization? How, how do you kind of support your integrator in that? Well, I think Eric's the perfect integrator in that role and perfect again for me and for us as a company because he doesn't feel it's thankless and he enjoys being the tough hand in some situations, but he does it with respect and love. Mm -hmm. He'll say to someone, hey, Igor, listen, I know we're going to disagree here. I know you don't like to hear this, but here's the reality yeah. and here's why I'm making this decision. So he's great at it. He loves it. He knows it makes an impact and his feelings aren't hurt. Yeah. Now he gets plenty of thank yous from me and the leadership team and franchise partners yeah. because he's so skilled at doing these things in the right way. So it, it just works. Yeah. Yeah. It, very, very interesting. Fascinating. Um, I got one other question here. Go ahead. Cause I, I want to move on from here to, yeah. to one other topic. Okay. Yeah. So we've talked about uh, the importance of this relationships, the, the search for it. We've talked about a few mistakes along the way. I think we'd be remiss not to ask a question here, which I'm sure is on the minds of the listener, which is, it is a journey and you're not going to, you're not going to hit it perfectly the first time, sometimes not even the second time it might take you five, five tries to find the right, the right uh, piece to your puzzle. 
What can you say about, what have you learned about having to make not big hires, but big fires where it's like, man, this is a big position, highly paid. It's highly public. I'm going to look bad. I'm going to feel bad, but I know it's the right thing. And I probably have to do this for, our, I know that there's listeners who would st- probably are in this situation right now. They hired someone, they thought there was going to be their COO or their integrator and a year down the road, they're going, ah, it's just this, this isn't it. What advice would you give to that person? When they say it's lonely at the top, this, this is a story of loneliness. When I got my ex Starbucks person out, mm-hmm. I could see this was not going in the right direction. We weren't fighting, we weren't hating each other, but it just, it was not working and I needed to pivot sooner. Otherwise we weren't gonna have a company. We almost bankrupted the company. It was 2008, nine, 10, that time frame there of uh, difficult times in the, the financial meltdown. And I had to make a tough decision and I knew nobody else supported it. I had a board member, that was it, who supported it with me and we'd be off and off site talking through it and working through plans. And are we gonna do this? Are we gonna pull the trigger? And I knew in my heart it was the right thing. And we pulled the trigger and got this person out. But getting that person out meant also getting the CFO out because they were too aligned that I couldn't continue on. We then had to take the rest of the leadership team and get them out because we couldn't afford to keep them at a time when things were sort of falling apart, almost bankrupting my baby after 20 years. And I had to elevate a junior team to rise up. They were excited about the opportunity, but they still said, Brian, what are you, what are you doing here, man? Like, mm-hmm. this is crazy. Not one of them left. They stuck by my side. I didn't give them all the details. I said, trust me, we're going to make this work. But it was lonely at the top. For a couple of years, I had to, three years, I had to do everything while I was recruiting and f- looking for Eric. And was it a mistake? No, it was the right thing for me to correct the mistake of the wrong hire but it meant a lot of painful work to get through to get there. It's not this like surgical correction where it's like, oh, I'll just like unplug the light bulb and plug it back in. Like it's a, this is a it was tectonic a wrecking, ball. Sh- a wrecking ball. This is a, ma- there is a massive event in trauma. It's like, it's more like cutting off a limb than it is like, you know, getting a wart removed. Like it's a big freaking deal. And I think that's why I want to ask the question. It's like, I guess you just say, suck up the courage and make it happen and trust your gut and know that three years later, you're going to feel that way. You look at, you look back to your vision, if you're a visionary and you say, how much do I believe in that future and what decision needs to be made to get to that future? So in my book, WTF, Willing to Fail, one of the little things in there I talk about is the right thing, the right decision. The right thing is seldom the easy thing. The right thing in this case was freaking hard. Take a wrecking ball to your company and there's just like collateral damage everywhere. Yeah. But say to everybody, trust me, I know you don't know why we did this, but everything's going to be okay. People look back now and go, Brian, you made the right decision. Of course, thank goodness. But But you're you're willing to do it because you believe in that vision so much and you know for the service of that vision that that's what needs to be done. Yeah. I didn't want to give up on something that was seemingly impossible. Yeah. uh, But we made it through. Yeah, su- super interesting. To close off this this part of the conversation, I want to ask you kind of like one big, most important piece of advice that you have for an entrepreneur that's out there l- realizing that they need a powerful integrator. If you had kind of like one closing piece of guidance for them, what would it be? I think it's making sure that you find the right person for you. I've said that several times through this podcast. For you specifically. For you specifically. So... You might be a visionary, you might be great at being an implementer and you need a visionary, but find the right person for you and they must, absolutely must believe in your gifts and have the strengths to support your weaknesses. So find the right person, but never compromise. It's the one hire where when I got it wrong, I almost bankrupted my company. Yeah. And uh, when I got it right, we went from 100 million to 500 million to like, we'll get to a billion in, in no time. Yeah. But because I took the time to get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Fascinating. Benji, hey, before we close out, do you have any final questions? I've got a couple quick hit questions here. We're almost out of time, but I got a couple quick hit ones. Our listeners uh, want to know I texted them and asked about this, this massive deal. I think it was with, was with waste management. There was a huge offer on the table and you said no. Tell us about the story and tell us the why behind it. Waste management said, we want to invite you on a retreat. 
with a bunch of other execs from different companies. They took me to Sonora Lodge, fancy pants, like seven star hotel <laughs> uh, off of Vancouver Island. We flew in on a float plane to get there. And I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. Hanging out with a couple of execs. They took me fishing. And we're at a point where we are all, so far from the shore that you don't know which way the shore is. Two garbage execs in a boat with me catching fish and they're trying to buy my company. Say no at that moment when you're so far from shore, you know, little soprano-ish. Sure. I'm like, am I ever going to make it back to shore? I feel like I've got no choice here but to say yes. And I said to them, hey, listen, you know, they said, we're talking like 75 to $100 million. My small company back then was a ton of money. I said, honestly, you could offer me a billion, which I know is so ridiculously makes no sense. And the answer would still be no. And I risked not getting back to shore because I said, hey, listen, I love my business so much. I love the purpose and the vision of where we're going. I want to get it there. I don't want you to get it there. And no amount of money could take that away from me. So it was an easy no. I mean, they literally followed up and flew up seven execs on their Learjet to come meet with us at the junction to try and sell me into this. And I go, guys, it's fun having dinner with you and would love a flight on your jet. But no, this isn't like, I don't, I can't give up on something that I know I can do and want to be a part of. And I have to ask on that, what, what is it about your vision that you felt so strongly about that you had to say that? We, together with our franchise partners, are providing what my why was that Simon Sinek talked about, giving people possibilities. Can you imagine owning your own brand and business and building something and having a great life and developing your own people and having them have ownership opportunities? So many of our franchise partners have brought in owners into their system as they've gone out and acquired more Shack Shines or 1-800-GUT-JUNKS. Mm -hmm. I want to be a part of seeing people take advantage of opportunity and live their dream life. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a car guy as an example, but when I know Paul Guy has his R8 and he's driving around in Toronto and feeling like he made it, that makes me feel good. Yeah. Whatever it is that drives someone, if they have a vision for their life and one of our franchises can help them live that dream, yeah. that's what I wanted to do. And we're doing, and we're still doing. So there's no giving up anytime soon. You, we've we've covered a bit about how you got here. I think this is a good question to, to close on. What's next for you guys? Tell us about like the BHAG for Odui. And then at the same time, maybe maybe just tell us about like the biggest obstacle in getting there, the biggest domino you need to tip over to make it happen. That's a great question. So O2E right now stands for Ordinary to Exceptional. We take ordinary people, ordinary business ideas, and we make them exceptional through people and service and all the awesome things we do. Finding more of a great thing is exactly what I want to continue doing. So yes, we'll get to a billion sometime soon. We'll get to two billion. It's not about the money. It's about what that size and scope of our brands means for the people that are on board. So met a guy, uh, franchise owner, when I was down in Phoenix the other day, guy named Tony Palermo. He worked in the trucks as a general manager for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He heard a speaker, two speakers at our conference, our kickoff last year, talking about Wow One Day Painting, telling some stories, this little mini TED talk that they both gave. And he's like, he calls up and he's like, I, I know I'm in 1-800-GOT-JUNK and I love it, but I'm a general manager. I want to be an owner. And I love the mission of you painting homes in a day. I want to do this. So someone starting in the trucks and becoming an entrepreneur in any one of our brands, love that. I mean, it, it's just what gets me up in the morning, it's that. Now, Benji, you asked what's in our way. Mm -hmm. Painting's not sexy, nor is junk removal or shine in people's shacks. But what I think is sexy is developing amazing people, bringing people into your business and watching them have a great life. I look at Josh and Tyler in Kansas City they have over $100 million in revenue across their 1-800-GOT-JUNK and Shack Shine businesses. Wow. And what they do is they take their truck team members, they give them an opportunity to grow into ownership and be equity holding entrepreneurs. It just keeps scaling and getting bigger and better. The better is having people who believe in our vision of building something great together. It's so easy to get out of bed. So cool. 
That's amazing. Super powerful. Brian, I, uh, I love this conversation. I also like, I have to say, I don't think I've ever said this to you. I love your energy, man. This is why I like hanging out with you. Thanks, man. Yeah. Every time we have coffee, we have lunch. And I think it comes through in everything that we're talking about today. There's an inherent, like an optimism, a positivity. The world is full of beating you down show putting straight in front of you what you're not good at forcing you to work on it. And and I think one of the big things that I've learned from Brian over the years is that like sometimes it just is easier to swim downstream and, and to take the easier road. And it's not to say that you're not going to have to go through a lot of tough stuff, but you don't need to trudge through the mud all the time. And, and, and we're here to, have, to be happy and joyful. Yeah. Giving up is easy. <laughs> Giving up is easy, but it's kind of fun to do the impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having Amazing. me. Amazing. Brian, this has been great. If people want to keep to follow you, to hear more about like what you're up to, your perspectives, your wisdom, your way of operating, where can people just find out what you're up to and, and how your adventures keep going? And just put Brian Scudamore into Google and it'll find me. Awesome. Uh, social media, whatever you're looking for. And I'm always, I think you know this, and this is part of the reason we connected is just, it's so fun to help people. Yeah. So when people reach out and go, Brian, I know you've got the answer to this question. That's fun. Amazing. Brian, thanks for being on. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Benji, cheers, man. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.